Well, throughout this summer, we've been going through a series called Tough Questions, where we've been asked trying to answer uh, as many of your questions that you've asked uh, and that you've submitted to us through our website and the paper forms that we had out in the lobby. And uh, today we're going to try to answer uh, actually a a few questions that really kind of boil down uh, to one question. Uh, We received a a number of questions, even recently, uh, that were about the Bible. They they were about the Bible and, and whether or not you know, what we have here is, is God's Word. And so some of the questions we received were questions like, how did the Bible come to be as we have it today? Right? Uh, are there mistakes in the Bible? Uh, why aren't other written works such as the Apocrypha included in the Bible? And which Bible translations today are the best ones to use? And what, these, what all of these questions really kind of boil down to, and the underlying question uh, under all of these questions uh, really is the question, can we trust the Bible? Right? Can we trust the Bible? Can we trust, you know, that the Bible is truthful, that it's accurate? You know, can we trust that this is God's word to us, not just in the past, but God's word for us today? Well, the simple answer, as I've already heard some of you say, is yes. Yes, we can trust the Bible. Amen? Let's pray and go home, right? No, I'm kidding. Right? But, but it is true that we can truly trust the Bible. Uh, but I want you to be able to know some evidence and some proofs of why we can trust the Bible. And so we're going to look at and try and answer some of those uh, other smaller individual questions ultimately answering that question, can we trust the Bible? Now, if we look at Scripture itself and what the Bible says, it actually tells us, yes, you can trust the Bible. Let me give you a couple of examples. In Psalm 119, verse 160, uh, the psalmist wrote, all your words are true, writing to God, right? All your righteous laws are eternal. Then Jesus, in John chapter 17, verse 17, when he was praying for his followers, he prayed, sanctify them by the truth. Your word is truth. And of course, the Apostle Paul in 2 Timothy 3.16 wrote, all scripture is God-breathed, meaning it's inspired by God. And it's useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. Now friends, I understand, you know, the Bible saying that the Bible is true is kind of a circular reasoning type of thing. I get that, okay? But it is important in that it's not like the Bible, you know, says, oh hey, just so you know, this is a fictional work. Right? This is just made up. No, the Bible itself claims to be true. Now, another reason why we can trust the Bible is because of how the Bible came to be as we have it today. And so we're going to look at how the Bible came to be, starting with the Old Testament and then looking at the New Testament. Now, the Old Testament and the written word of Scripture didn't actually begin with us. It didn't actually begin with humanity. It actually began with God. It started when God wrote the Ten Commandments with his own finger on tablets of stone. If we go back to Exodus chapter 31, verse 18, it says, When the Lord finished speaking to Moses on Mount Sinai, he gave him the two tablets of the covenant law, the tablets of stone inscribed by the finger of God. Right? God was the one who actually said, hey, these people, they are so easily you know, willing to go away from what I'm teaching them, from, from what I want for them. And so it needs to be written down so that they can keep coming back to it over and over and over again. That no matter how many times they forget it, no matter how many times they choose to compromise, it's there for them in black and white. And so God wrote the Ten Commandments himself with his own finger on stone tablets. And then these tablets were placed inside the Ark 
of the covenant, which was seen as the location of God's presence that was in the center of the tabernacle when the Israelites traveled through the wilderness. And then when they settled in the land of Israel and they built a a more permanent structure, the temple, then it was in the center of the temple. And so those stone tablets were placed in the Ark of the Covenant. And from there, the collection of written words that were deemed to be the authoritative word of God grew, starting with Moses. Moses, uh, who was a, you might be familiar with him from the movie Prince of Egypt. Uh, He was a prince of Egypt. He was actually a a Jewish boy who was adopted into the Pharaoh's household and he was raised uh, as Egyptian royalty. Anyways, he is the author of the Pentateuch or the Torah, what we sometimes refer or how we refer to the first five books of the Bible. And it is Moses who explained the laws given by God as well as recorded the history of the world before his time, all of which he actually received from God. You see, there was many times that Moses actually went up on Mount Sinai, and he didn't just spend like a day or two in God's presence. I mean, we're talking like there was multiple stints of 40 days that he was up there listening to God, and then many other times that he would go into the tabernacle, the tent of meeting, where he would meet with God. And so in Deuteronomy chapter 31, near the very end of those first five books of the Bible, it says this, After Moses finished writing in a book the words of this law from beginning to end, he gave this command to the Levites who carried the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord. Take this book of the law and place it beside the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord your God, and there it will remain as a witness against you. And so Moses wrote down what God instructed him, and it was kind of placed beside or added to uh, those stone tablets. Then after the death of Moses, Joshua, who was not only the aide of Moses, but who was often with Moses when God spoke to Moses, and who God also spoke to directly himself, well, Joshua added to the collection of the written words of God, as well as the history of God's people as it unfolded over time. At the very end of the book of Joshua, it says, and Joshua recorded these things in the book of the law of God. Right? So he took the book that Moses wrote, and he, it's like he added another chapter to it. He added another volume to it to keep the story going, to continue to write down what God was speaking to his people. From there, other people, usually the prophets who were people who heard from God and spoke God's word directly to the people, these prophets wrote down additional words that God had given them directly. In 1 Samuel 10, verse 25, it says that Samuel explained to the people the rights and duties of kingship, and he wrote them down on a scroll and deposited it before the Lord. And then in 1 Chronicles 29, verse 29, We read, as for the events of King David's reign from beginning to end, they are written in the records of Samuel the seer, the records of Nathan the prophet, and the records of Gad the seer, where seer and prophet are kind of used interchangeably to talk about those who would directly receive the word of God to them. We also see this throughout the rest of the Old Testament. In 2 Chronicles 20. Verse 34, it says the other events of Jehoshaphat's reign from beginning to end are written in the annals of Jehu, son of Hanani, which are recorded in the book of the kings of Israel. And so if we go over to 1 Kings 16, verse 7, it says, Moreover, the word of the Lord came through the prophet Jehu, son of Hanani, recognizing Jehu as another one of the prophets. In 2 Chronicles 26, verse 22, it says the other events of Isaiah's reign from beginning to end are recorded by the prophet Isaiah, son of Amos, who not only wrote the history of many of the Israelite kings, but we also know that he recorded the words of God given to him in the book that we know as Isaiah. Right? And then, of course, there's the prophet Jeremiah as well. In Jeremiah 30, verse 2, it says, This is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says, Write in a book all the words that I have spoken to you. Now friends, these are just a few examples, but I I hope you kind of get the picture here. right? God spoke to his people through the prophets. And those prophets recognized that these being the words 
of God are so important that we actually need to write them down. We need to record them and preserve them, and when they're copied so that other people can read them, we need to make sure that those copies are perfect so that everybody can have the accurate word of God. Right? And so the prophets not only wrote the poetic portion of the Old Testament, what we often refer to as the major and minor prophets at the end of the Old Testament, but they also wrote a lot of the history that we have in the Old Testament as well. And so the Old Testament was written by those uh, to whom God spoke directly and who were eyewitnesses of what God did and of how the Israelites' history played out. And the Jewish people then took these writings and they organized them into a single collection, a single volume, which was completed around the year 435 B.C. Okay, the Old Testament was completed around the year 435 B.C. BC. And so the Jews accepted the Old Testament books that we have today as the Word of God centuries before Jesus was even born. We also know that the, the scriptures, the Old Testament scriptures, are true because Jesus himself affirmed the divine origin of these books through his own teaching. Right? He quoted from many of them as being the authoritative Word of God. Now, that doesn't mean though, that the Old Testament is easy to follow or to believe, right? Just because we have some evidence showing that it's true, it's not always easy to, to read and to see what we have in the Old Testament and go, oh, yeah, I agree, right? There's a lot of hard things that we see in the Old Testament. But rather than me mentioning them, take a few minutes around your table and share with each other what are some of the things that you see in the Old Testament that you have a hard time Believing, believing either that they're true or believing is in, yeah, that's true and I need to follow that. <laughs> All right? So take a few minutes around your tables and discuss. All right, we're going to bring things back together again. Uh, 
I should warn you when we do these little questions, it's, it's pretty quick. Each person gets 10, maybe 20 seconds so that everyone gets a chance to share with each other. Uh, but as I was kind of wandering around, I heard a, a number of different things like, you know, some of the miracles that, that happen. Like sometimes it's hard to believe, like, man, could that really have happened? Or maybe it was like God's judgment on people. Uh, I, you know, one table was talking about the plagues of Egypt, again, in that movie, The Prince of Egypt, that you might have seen, right? It's like, whoo, man, that, that's heavy, heavy stuff. And it's sometimes hard to wrap our heads around a, a God who's loving, but who's also just and will punish wrongdoers, right? And so it, it, it's tough. It's tough. But you know what? The, the Old Testament is true. It's accurate. Of course, that's the Old Testament, the first half or two-thirds of our Bible. But what about the New Testament? Well, after Jesus' death, resurrection, and ascension back to heaven, the first followers of Jesus quickly realized the importance of writing down what they had seen and heard from Jesus. Uh, right? They also took some time to explain, right? A lot of the New Testament is explanation of the things that Jesus said and did. And and this was really important because uh, in the early church, uh, a lot of the the teachings of Jesus as well as the details of his life, uh, they were either accidentally getting misconstrued or they were being purposefully twisted in order that people could use the scriptures to say whatever they wanted it to say. And so the, the apostles and the, the early disciples began to write down the life and the ministry of Jesus as well as explaining his teachings. Unfortunately, with these authoritative writings came counterfeits. And as false teachers began sowing confusion, the early church in the first couple of centuries after Christ, they had to decide which writings to recognize as the true and inspired words of of God. And so the leaders of the early church actually created three tests. Three tests to see whether or not, and to evaluate whether or not, a, a, a work of writing would be included in what we call the canon or the collection of Scripture. The first test was known as the test of the apostle. The test of the apostle. And what this test basically said is that any writing, any book or letter that they were evaluating had to have been written by one of the apostles, the, you know, the first followers of Jesus who were eyewitnesses of his life, ministry, death, and resurrection, or by someone who is directly connected to one of those apostles. So for example, the book of Matthew was written by the apostle Matthew. Right? Matthew had been a tax collector, and then Jesus came along and called Matthew to follow him. And so Matthew was one of the, the 12 disciples, the 12 closest men to Jesus. Whereas when we look at the book of Mark, Mark wasn't one of the 12 disciples. But Mark was written by a man named John Mark. They called him Mark because there's too many Johns back then. Um, but he, it was written by John Mark, and, and John Mark was a, a close friend and fellow worker with the Apostle Peter. And so most scholars believe that the book of Mark is actually Peter's eyewitness account of what he saw when he spent time with Jesus. Friends, this is actually true for all 27 books of the New Testament. Uh, Luke and Acts. They were written by Dr. Luke, who was a traveling companion and friend of the Apostle Paul. And so because of that connection with Paul, he also was directly connected with the other apostles. He could interview them and then write down what they shared with him. Uh, John, the Gospel of John, was written by the Apostle John, one of the twelve disciples, as was 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John, as well as Revelation, the last book of the New Testament. Uh, Many of the letters were, of course, written by the Apostle Paul, who saw Jesus in a miraculous way and was directly connected with the 12 disciples as well. Uh, And his letters include uh, Romans, 1st and 2nd Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, 1st and 2nd Thessalonians, 1st and 2nd Timothy, Titus, and Philemon. Uh, James was written by the half-brother of Jesus, uh, as was uh, the book of Jude. 
Uh, James was one of the early church leaders in the city of Jerusalem, and Jude uh, was also uh, a brother of Jesus. He was, his actual name was Judas, but for obvious reasons of not wanting to be mistaken with Judas Iscariot, uh, they called him Jude instead. Uh, and then, of course, First and Second Peter were written by the apostle Peter. In fact, the only book that was ever really kind of debated was the book of Hebrews. Uh, Hebrews uh, was, uh, you know, somewhat contentious in knowing who actually wrote this. Uh, you see, early on, it was believed that Hebrews was written by the Apostle Paul as well. Um, however, because of its style, and because it's actually quite different from the other letters that the Apostle Paul wrote, uh, some people started to doubt that and believe that it must have been written by someone else. Now, personally, I think it still could have been written by Paul in that uh, he probably wrote in a very different way when writing to the Hebrews, to, to his fellow Jews, than compared to how he wrote to the Gentiles, right? And those other, the other letters to the churches that we have. However, there is still no consensus today as to who the author of Hebrews is. Uh, some have suggested that it might have been Apollos or Barnabas or another companion of Paul. Uh, either way, it still kind of checks that box uh, uh, as being written or connected to or being written by somebody connected to the apostles. But it is also included in Scripture because it passes the other two tests of being included in the canon. Uh, the second test was a test of consistency. A test of consistency. And what this test was all about is every uh, work of writing that was evaluated, they would read it and they would study it and they would see if what it said was consistent with what was already accepted as Scripture. Not only the other books of the New Testament, but also going back to the Old Testament as well. And so there were actually a lot of documents that they evaluated that were mostly true. But if a document contains any kind of error or any kind of discrepancy with those writings that were already considered Scripture, then it was actually rejected outright. It was not believed to be Scripture. And that's because the early church leaders believed that if a book was truly inspired by God then it would be inerrant. That it would actually have no mistakes in it at all. In fact, friends, that's the only way that 40 plus authors writing over the course of approximately 1,600 years could have the same message. That, that can only happen if God was the true author speaking and writing through all of these individuals to create one unified and complete volume. So, the first test was the test of the apostle. The second test, the test of consistency. The third test and, and the final test was the test of antiquity. And that simply uh, asked the question of whether or not the people in the church already accepted that writing as being the true word of God. Okay? Uh, there were some debates over certain books such as Hebrews because of its authorship. Uh, but most of the books that are included in the New Testament today were books that were already largely accepted by the church uh, at that time in the early church, long before getting the final approval for inclusion within the canon of Scripture. Uh, and, and that's, you know, quite logical, because if we think about it, the people in the 2nd and 3rd, you know, maybe even going into the 4th century, they had some direct connections that they could actually trace back to the original apostles. Right? They, they received these writings from individuals that they trusted and knew well who received it from individuals who received it directly from the apostles. Right? It's only a couple of generations removed from the original writers. And so there was this kind of you know, church history, this you know, tradition of recognizing these are true words of God compared to other works, right? There were a lot of false works, okay? I, I don't think we understand how spoiled we are to have everything kind of neatly bound in one volume like this, but there was a lot of, of controversy and, and false written works. Uh, for example, there's one book 
called the Gospel of Thomas. And, it, you know, some people were trying to, you know, let it be known or get people to believe that it was written by uh, one of the apostles, the Apostle Thomas. We often refer to him as Doubting Thomas, right? The guy who put his uh, fingers into the nail holes on Jesus' hands and feet and his hand into the spear wound on his side. But when people read the Gospel of Thomas, not only did they realize that it was false because it didn't line up with the other accounts of Jesus' life, but they also recognized that it wasn't true because it was actually written like 200 years later, right? And so there's all these tests to help us understand that the New Testament is true as well, right? These writings went through all kinds of scrutiny uh, to help figure out which books of the Bible should actually be accepted. And so we can trust that the Bible is true, that it is trustworthy. Uh, as most of the, bi- the books that are included, especially in the New Testament, were already historically accepted as authoritative within the church before the Council of Carthage in AD 397, when the list of the 27 books of the New Testament that we have today was finalized. So, I asked you about the Old Testament, about what, what's kind of hard to believe and, and accept in the Old Testament. Uh, what about the New Testament, right? What do, you, what do Jesus and the apostles teach that you might maybe struggle to, to trust and believe? So take, take a few minutes around your tables and, and discuss this one, right? We looked at the Old Testament, now let's look at the New Testament. Uh, and even if you believe, yeah, this is the Word of God, you know, what commands of Christ do you have a hard time accepting and trusting, right? Uh, Believing and following. Take a few moments to talk around your tables. All right. Well, I hope you had some good conversation around your topic. I heard somebody say, that's not a fair question. That's a hard one, right? And, and it is. It really is uh, because, you know, believing that, that it's true means that it actually requires a change in us, right? It requires us to change the way that we, we live our lives. But friends, I, I hope you can understand and you can see that not only the Old Testament but the New Testament I think sometimes in our culture we have this idea of people from the past were unintelligent or that they just kind of slapped it together of, oh yeah, sure, why not this one? But the reality is there was a lot of scrutiny. They worked incredibly hard to make sure that what they had was the authoritative word of God 
and when it was copied and when it was passed on to other people, I mean, it was scrutinized and, and edit, you know, evaluated to make sure that everything that was being passed on was accurate to the original. And so when it comes to putting the Bible together, I mean, this is like 66 different books all in one volume. And so as I mentioned earlier, there were a lot of other writings that were rejected and not included within Scripture, like the Gospel of Thomas. Uh, and that's because a lot of them had errors in them. They, they weren't accurate, or some of them were even trying to teach lies and heresy to confuse people. Uh, and so that's why they weren't included. However, because the Roman Catholic Church continues to use a collection of books called the Apocrypha, and because somebody recently was asking me uh, about those books, uh, I thought I should quickly address the Apocrypha specifically. Now, if you're not familiar with the Apocrypha, it's simply a set of books uh, similar to what we have in, in our Bible. Uh, not as many, not 66, but a number of books. I think it's around a dozen books or so. And they were written in the time between the Old Testament and the New Testament. During what is often referred to uh, as the 400 years of silence, because God was, in a sense, silent in that there were no new revelations from God through his prophets, there were still religious and historical writings that were being written by the Jewish people. Right? And remember, the Old Testament w was finished and finalized in 435 B.C., and Jesus didn't come until around the year 4 or 2 B.C. And so there's a 400-year gap approximately where it kind of feels, at least within our Bibles, that, that God was silent. And so during that time, there were writings that were happening, and, and those writings were collected, uh, and the books are referred to as the Apocrypha. However, while these volumes have been helpful in many ways to help us understand what happened during that time period, they are not considered scripture for a number of reasons. Uh, first, we see that the Jews never accepted the Apocrypha as scripture. Uh, some of you might be familiar with the first century Jewish historian named Josephus. Well, Josephus lived right around the time of Jesus, and, and this is one of the things that he wrote about the Apocrypha. He wrote, from Artaxerxes who was a ruler in Babylon, to our own times, a complete history has been written referring to these writings of the Apocrypha. But, has, but this writing has not been deemed worthy of equal credit with the earlier records, talking about the Old Testament, because of the failure of the exact succession of the prophets. And so what we see here is that Josephus himself knew that the, these writings, the Apocrypha, that they were not considered worthy of being Scripture, right? He said that they are not worthy of equal credit with what we call the Old Testament. And in his reasoning, Josephus recognized that, he recognized that there were mistakes in these apocryphal writings, uh, which is, is one of the reasons why they weren't included in the Scripture, right? It wasn't perfect, therefore it wasn't the authoritative word of God. Now, another reason why the Apocrypha wasn't included in the Bible is because Jesus and the New Testament authors never actually referred to or quoted from the Apocrypha. Uh, friends, there are uh, a lot of different estimates as to how many times the New Testament quotes the Old Testament. Uh, but most of the estimates are around 300. That's right, 300 times somewhere in the New Testament is quoting somewhere in the Old Testament. That's 300 times that Jesus and the apostles quoted the Old Testament, and yet not one of those times was a quote of the Apocrypha. In fact, not one of those times was there a, a quote of anything outside of Scripture that was deemed as authoritative, right? The only words that were deemed authoritative were the quotes looking back to the Old Testament itself. And so... When it comes to the Apocrypha, this is how the Jews in that time viewed these writings, right? They didn't see it as Scripture. However, since then, some have argued for the inclusion of the Apocrypha within the Bible, uh, especially the, the Roman Catholic Church. Uh, while the early church was decidedly against uh, 
including the Apocrypha in Scripture. Uh, some of you might be familiar with a, a, a guy named Jerome who wrote the Latin version of the Bible, what's called the Latin Vulgate. And Jerome was the first one to actually include the Apocrypha in the Bible. From there, it's been debated throughout the centuries with some believing it should be included, others believing it shouldn't be included. That is until what we refer to as the Protestant Reformation. Uh, In the 1500s, there was a man named Martin Luther who, as a Catholic monk, began to read the Bible for himself and realized that there were a lot of abuses in that time uh, by the Catholic Church. Uh, twisting scripture to say what they wanted it to say and getting people to give them more and more money and property. Basically using the Bible as a means of getting wealthy and manipulating people, uh, basically robbing people. And so uh, what happened was Martin Luther wrote up what's known as his 95 Theses. He nailed it to the, the church door in Wittenberg And basically that began a a, a schism where the Protestant church broke away from the Roman Catholic church. And so in 1546, in order to try to uh, convince some of those people who were leaving to come back, the Roman Catholic church in, in what's known as the Council of Trent declared the Apocrypha to be a part of Scripture. Right? So as some people were leaving because they didn't like some of the abuses, the Catholic Church said, hey, but if you stay with us, we'll include the Apocrypha. And so some of the people who were leaving went, ooh, I like that, and came back. Right? And so what it did was it actually divided the church even more between the Roman Catholic Church and the Protestant Church. And so, but what it also did show is that by including the Apocrypha, the Roman Catholics revealed their belief that the church has the authority to decide which literary works to include in Scripture. Protestants, on the other hand, and just so you know, that includes us as evangelicals, we hold to the belief that the church doesn't choose what's included in Scripture, but that we can only recognize what God has already uh, caused to be written as Scripture. We we are simply looking at this and going, yeah, I mean, God, you're the one who made this Scripture. We're not choosing this, you chose this, and we simply recognize the work that you're doing. And ultimately, it came down to that aspect of having no errors. And so, boiling it down, ultimately the Apocrypha shouldn't be considered uh, as Scripture for four reasons. First, uh, these writings will be up on the screen. Uh, the Apocrypha doesn't claim to have the same authority as Scripture. Remember at the beginning I read from the Bible that the Bible itself claims to be Scripture? The Apocrypha doesn't do that. Second, uh, the Apocrypha wasn't regarded as Scripture by its authors. Right? Those who wrote down the Apocrypha didn't write in such a way as believing that this should be included with the Old Testament, whereas the Apostles did. Okay? Third, the Apostles, uh, or sorry, the Apocrypha wasn't included in Scripture because uh, they're not conscripted considered scripture by Jesus and the New Testament writers. And fourth, the Apocrypha contains teachings that are inconsistent with the Bible, right? They fail that test of an antiquity and consistency. And so all that to say, I know it's quite technical, but all that to say that the 66 books that make up our Old and New Testaments today are the most faithful and logical books to be included in the Bible. And friends, we truly can trust the canon or the collection of Scripture that we have today. We truly can trust this book or this volume of books as God's Word for us today. And one other thing I'll mention, that the canon or collection of Scripture is now closed. Uh, It has been since 397 A.D., meaning that we are not to add any books to this. We are not to subtract any books from this. This is the same Bible that they had, you know, 2,000 years ago, pretty much. Now, so that's how we kind of came to have the Bible that we have today. But I know this doesn't answer all questions about the trustworthiness of Scripture, and the reality is, is that we'll never be able to do that. We'll never be able to answer every single question, every single 
doubt. It takes faith. It, it takes faith. Not only does it take faith uh, to be a Christian and a follower of Jesus, but it also takes faith to trust and believe that God is the one who orchestrated the writing of the Scriptures. However, even though it takes faith, friends, please understand, it's not a blind faith. It's not a blind faith at all. In fact, there are mountains of evidence that point to the accuracy and the trustworthiness of the Bible. Uh, Let me give you a couple examples. Uh, First, there's archaeological evidence. Archaeological evidence that, that proves the truthfulness of Scripture. Uh, There are many archaeologists who have tried to follow other historical writings to find ancient cities, and they've been led astray. But for those who have studied the Scriptures where it says, oh, it's this distance from this city and this distance from that city along this route, they've gone, they've dug, and sure enough, they found the ancient ruins of these old cities. There's also uh, the evidence of firsthand accounts and witnesses. I know we've kind of mentioned this already before, but those who wrote the Bible either saw what happened themselves, was told about it by God, or heard it from one or more eyewitnesses. And we often like to kind of discount that in our culture, but friends, in our own courts of law today, those eyewitness accounts would be held as incredibly valuable evidence towards the truthfulness of what really happened happened. Then there's the fulfillment of prophecy, right? God said that certain things would happen, and like hundreds of years later, it happened, right? And, and so there's this recognition that even as God, you know, spoke and then it happened, that we can actually trust it. And for those things that haven't yet been fulfilled, we can trust that they're still going to happen, that God will carry out his perfect will. Uh, There's also corroborating literary evidence where other historical writings from other places and other cultures um, that they agree with what the Bible has said. Friends, I could go on and on. In fact, I even had a number of pieces of evidence ready to share with you, but I'm looking at the time and we just don't have time to go into it. So if you want to come and talk about those, I'd love to talk with you after. Or if you want to get a hold of me from home, if you're watching online, uh, let me know. I'd love to go for coffee with you, if, if you're wondering, is there actual tangible evidence? The answer is yes. There is lots of evidence to prove the truthfulness and the trustworthiness of the Bible. However, before we wrap up, I do want to touch on one last question that somebody asked, and that was about the different translations of the Bible that we have today. Uh, I I get that in our information age today with so much information and and the internet, it can be hard to know if what we're reading is true, right? Because there seems to be so many different, you know, perspectives and so many people trying to twist things to get you to believe what they believe. And so the same could be, you know, seen as true for the different Bible translations, but friends, I want to let you know you really don't have to worry about that, okay? The Bible translations that we have today are incredible. They have some of the the best scholarship. They use uh, the the oldest manuscripts. Uh, In fact, they they are trying to be so accurate that most of you, if you read your Bible, you might notice every once in a while that there might be like an asterisk or a footnote. And at the bottom of the page, it'll even tell you, hey, this is how we think it should be you know, interpreted. But there are other views out there, including this and this and this or whatever. right? Telling you, letting you know that, that they're striving to get the best possible understanding of the Bible to you. And, and I will also mention on those points of discrepancy where there's some disagreements over what it might mean, those are usually on periphery issues, not on, on the core central doctrines of our faith. And so we have incredible translations of the Bible today. But with that said, we do need to understand that different translators take different approaches when it comes to how they're trying to Uh, communicate the Word of God. For some, they are trying to produce the most accurate word-for-word translation 
of the Bible. Uh, this would include uh, translations like the New American Standard Bible or the English Standard Version. Uh, some of you, if you're you know, brave, might even try reading the interlinear, which puts the English words in the order of the original Hebrew and Greek and Aramaic. And so it doesn't make sense to our brains, let me tell you. Uh, but, but some translations try to be as accurate as possible uh, in word-for-word translations. And these Bibles are great for in-depth and detailed Bible study, uh, but I'll warn you, they can be hard to understand, right? They often use really big theological terms. You know, if you're not comfortable with justification, sanctification, propitiation, words like that, if you're like, I'm going to need a dictionary with me, that it might not be the kind of translation for you, right? It, it'll also include the old you know, units of measurement, like a span or a cubit, which most of us are like, what? What is that, right? Uh, And and that's why there's other translators that that try to translate and communicate the main thoughts and ideas of what's written in Scripture. These translations are usually referred to as thought-for-thought translations, and their goal is to help communicate the main ideas that the biblical writers were trying to convey but in a way that we can more easily understand, right? And so even over the course of time, we've seen different translations come out as the English language has changed. How many of you grew up or have read a King James Version Bible? Now, how many of you always go around talking using thee and thou and thine and yet yeah, none of us, right? The King James Version was written back in the 1600s when that's how a lot of people spoke. That's how a lot of the written word was written. I mean, just read Shakespeare. It's not easy, right? Today, we don't use those kinds of words, so we need newer translations uh, that use English the way that we understand it. And so, uh, just to give you a little bit of an example, this chart coming up on the screen here, it will show you, there we go, this shows you some of the more, uh, more well-known translations of the Bible. And you can kind of see that on the left side here, we have the word-for-word versions. You have the NASB, the ESP, the AMP. Uh, moving more into the thought-for-thought style of translations, you know, the New King James Version, the New Revised Standard Version, the New International Version, which is what we usually use on Sunday mornings, and the New Living Translation. And then on the far right there, you see uh, another category known as paraphrase. And and I want to just quickly touch on what a paraphrase is. A paraphrase is not a translation. Okay? A paraphrase is not a translation. Uh, Translations go back to the oldest manuscripts that we have. They go back to the ancient Hebrew and Aramaic and Greek and translate from that into English. What a paraphrase is, is it's one individual or a group of of people, they sit down, they read the English Bible, and then they try to kind of reword it or say it in a way that might be a little bit easier for people to understand or, or kind of highlighting, you know, a specific aspect of that passage, right? Uh, one of the most popular paraphrases today is called The Message. Uh, the Message is a, a paraphrase where a man named Eugene Peterson uh, and... and he was a brilliant man, right? A biblical scholar, a, a teacher in seminary. Like he is a brilliant, was a brilliant man. He's passed away now. Um, but Eugene Peterson wrote down his understanding of what each verse or each passage in the Bible means to him. And so paraphrases can actually be quite helpful in, in, in helping us understand what a verse or passage means. And, and I myself have even found that sometimes reading the message alongside of my Bible can help give me a, a, a greater understanding because it looks at things from a perspective that's not my natural perspective. And so it can help bring a, a greater understanding that way. However, I do want to, again, reiterate that a paraphrase is not a translation. Okay? It, it's one person or a group of people's understanding of the Bible, and therefore it is not Scripture itself. Okay, Um, so if you want to read a paraphrase, if that's going to help you understand the Bible more, let me encourage you, like, like go for it. But read it 
beside your Bible. Have your Bible open to the same passage so that you're getting the unhindered Word of God alongside of somebody else's interpretation and understanding of those words. Friends, I, I know we've gone in really technical this morning. I know some of you have kind of glazed over already and are you looking forward to lunch. And, and I get it. This is a lot of technical jargon. Uh, but the reality is, and, and why I bring all of this up, is to simply help us to have that confidence and know that, yes, we can trust the Bible. We can trust the Bible as we have it today. And it's because we can trust the Bible that we put ourselves under the Scriptures. Right? There's a lot of people when it comes to this book, there's a lot of people who like to take it and, and, and twist it to make it say what they want it to say. Right? And, and in essence, what they're saying is, yeah, maybe this is God's Word, but I'm putting myself as the authority over this book. We don't do that. We put ourselves under the Word of God. We recognize that this is the authoritative Word of God, and so we submit ourselves to what God is speaking to us through these pages rather than lording ourselves over it, trying to make it say what we want it to say. The Bible really is God's Word. It is God's revelation to us, and it is God's good news for us. And because we can trust the Bible, this reality requires two things of us that I want to ask you in two questions. First, do you read it? Do you read it? Right? If this truly is God's word for us, do you read this book? And I'm not just talking about on a Sunday morning when I put the words on the screen for you or every once in a while, maybe when you get together with your small group or, uh, you know, Christmas morning, let's read the Christmas story or the Easter story. I'm talking about every day, day in, day out, do you consistently get alone by yourself and spend some time reading your Bible, allowing God to speak to you through his written word. That is so important as a follower of Christ. We need to allow God's word to speak to our hearts and speak to our lives. Of course, this leads to the second and, and really a follow-up question of, will you trust the Bible? Right? Not just do you read it, but will you trust the Bible? Will you trust the God's word, and will you trust God ultimately so much that you will actually obey it and obey Him? Will you follow His instructions for your life? Friends, we don't just trust the Bible to present truth to us. We trust it as God's word and our guidebook, our manual for life. And so will you follow what God says to you through the Scriptures? It, it takes work. Don't get me wrong. I know a lot of the things that is written in the Old Testament and some of the things even in the New Testament, it sounds weird to us. And some of those things are cultural or some of those things Jesus has already dealt with and he changed when he died and rose again. But we need to allow God to speak to us through his word. And then when we hear from God, we need to respond to him in obedience. And we need to follow his word. Friends, this is a beautiful book. This is a beautiful book. In fact, many people have, have died in the course of history so that we could have access to God's Word today. But I also do want to remind us that we don't worship this book. This book is given to us so that we might know God. So that Jesus could reveal Himself to us Today, he could reveal his love to us, his goodness towards us. He could reveal to us the way that he wants us to live our lives, the good lives that he wants us to live, lives lived for him, which are ultimately for our good as well. And so let me encourage you 
Read your Bible. Study it. Follow God's instructions in this. Not as the religious leaders in Jesus' time did in order to, as they thought, earn their way into heaven, but so that we might know the one true God who loves us and who gave his son for us. Would you pray with me? Father, thank you so much for your goodness towards us. And God, we, we thank you. We thank you that over the course of, of history and time, you have preserved your written word for us. Lord, forgive us for when we so easily take it for granted. So many of us have a Bible or even multiple Bibles and they just sit on our shelves collecting dust. God, uh, we would never do that if we had the opportunity to, to sit down and talk with a celebrity or a president or a, a world leader. So God, would you, you convict us? Would you remind us daily to pick up that book? To read it? To allow you to speak to us through the words on, on the pages? And God, would you, would you lead us and guide us? Teach us the way that you want us to live. Reveal to us the way that you want us to go in this life. And Lord, would you teach us to draw closer to you? As you've promised, you will draw close to those who draw close to you. Thank you for your word. In Jesus' name, amen.